The pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. These insightful words were spoken by the atheistic astronomer Carl Sagan. As Sagan noted, stories of dragon encounters permeate the legends, lore, and histories of every major people group in the world. Ancient Chinese, Native American Indians, early Germanic tribes, South American Nazcans, Greeks, Dogon and Bambara tribes of Mali, Persians, Scandinavians, Babylonians, Ashanti of West Africa, Egyptians, Romans, peoples of ancient India, and many others. How can this be explained? Carl Sagan strained credulity by suggesting that our far distant evolutionary ancestors saw dinosaurs and somehow passed these frightful memories down from generation to generation over the millions of years. But rather than believing in a far-fetched scenario whereby a squirrel-like ancestor passed a vision of dinosaurs to its descendants by some unknown biological mechanism, we can look to the Bible to provide the straightforward truth as we explore the historical era of dragons and men. The Bible explains how God used Noah to save two of every kind of land creature that he had made, including the dinosaurs. Dinosaur kinds were probably represented aboard the ark as juveniles. Some of these families of great reptiles that came off of Noah's ark would have gone extinct in subsequent years due to the harsh climatic conditions, but others adapted or survived in remote tropical regions. As human civilization spread across the earth, men encountered these large reptiles and recorded their interactions. It became standard practice for ancient map makers to identify the unexplored regions at the periphery of their maps with the cryptic words, here be dragons. The word dragon appears 34 times in the authorized version of the scriptures. Notice the words of the psalmist. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall you trample under feet. From the context, it is clearly speaking about a real creature that it would be impressive and intimidating to step on. Jeremiah 51.34 tells how the king of Babylon has swallowed me up like a dragon, which brings to mind the way many carnivorous reptiles gulp their prey whole. Both dragons of the sea, Psalm 74.13, and field, Isaiah 43.20, are mentioned. The Bible even alludes to the vocalization of the dragon. In Micah 1.8, I will make a wailing like the dragons. The fact that dragons were powerful, frightening creatures is demonstrated by the book of Revelation likening Satan himself to a great red dragon. Revelation 12.9 World Book Encyclopedia states, the dragons of legend are strangely like actual creatures that have lived in the past. 
They are much like the great reptiles which existed long before man is supposed to have appeared on the earth. Dragons were generally evil and destructive. Every country had them in its mythology. The truth is that the fathers of modern paleontology used the terms dinosaur and dragon interchangeably for quite some time. Sir Richard Owen coined the term dinosaur in 1842. Before that, all scientists called the great reptiles dragons. Doubtless, some of the dragon stories that have been handed down over the generations have been exaggerated somewhat, but that does not mean they had no original basis in fact. Dinosaur skeletons have even been found that display some of the same peculiar dragon features that were once thought to be fanciful. In 2004, a fascinating dinosaur skull was discovered in South Dakota. Because of its dragon-like head, horns, and teeth, the new species was dubbed Draco Rex Hogwartsia. The dinosaur's skull mixes spiky horns, bumps, and a long muzzle. As you peruse the exhibit hall at Genesis Park, you will see some clear dinosaurian depictions made by ancient artists. Dinosaur iconography from painting, carvings, tapestry work, figurines, and simple etchings attest to the fact that men in antiquity encountered living dinosaurs. But there are also many credible written reports that come down to us from sober historians. Accounts of Dragons and Men Dragon histories go back as far as the ancient Gilgamesh epic, a Sumerian story written about 2000 BC. After Alexander the Great invaded India, he brought back reports of seeing a great hissing dragon living in a cave. Later Greek rulers supposedly captured dragons in Ethiopia and brought them back alive. The Chinese have the oldest intact civilization. Their stories of dragons and some of their ornamental pictures of dragons are remarkably like dinosaurs. Marco Polo wrote of his travels to the province of Karajan and reported on huge serpents, which at the forepart have two short legs, each with three claws and large jaws. Books even tell of Chinese families raising dragons to use their blood for medicines and highly prizing their eggs. It is interesting that the 12 signs of the Chinese zodiac are all animals, 11 of which are still seen today. But is the 12th, the dragon, merely a legend, or is it based on a real animal, the dinosaur? It doesn't seem logical that the ancient Chinese, when constructing their zodiac, would include one mythical animal with 11 real animals. The interpretation of dinosaurs as dragons goes back more than 2,000 years in Chinese culture. They were regarded as sacred, as a symbol of power. China's oldest known dragon depiction is a curious discovery found at the ancient Zhishui Po Cemetery ruins along the Yellow River in Henan Province. There, three artistic dragons, along with tigers and other animals, composed entirely of white shells, were placed alongside human remains. The Zhishui Po site dates back several thousand years, yet the dragons shown are surprisingly like modern renditions. This shows the dragon concept did not slowly develop through Chinese history from a simplistic, primitive, mythological form. This is evidence that they were modeled after living creatures. St. John of Damascus, an Eastern monk who lived in the 8th century, wrote a sober account of dragons, insisting that they are mere reptiles and did not have magical powers. He quoted the Roman historian Dio, who chronicled the Roman Empire in the 2nd century. 
It seems that when Regulus, a Roman consul, fought against Carthage, a dragon suddenly crept up and settled behind the wall of the Roman army. The Romans killed it, skinned it, and sent the hide to the Roman Senate. Dio claimed the hide was measured by order of the Senate and found to be 120 feet long. It is unlikely that either Dio or the pious St. John would support an outright fabrication involving a Roman consul and the Senate. One of the most popular stories in medieval Europe was the legend of St. George slaying a dragon. Originating in the region of Libya and spread by the Crusaders, the story very likely had some basis in fact. According to the legend, a frightful dragon resided in a swamp and lake near a small fiefdom. In an effort to appease the dragon and preserve their city, the inhabitants fed it two sheep every day. When they ran out of sheep, the people began to offer their children, chosen by lot. On one day, it happened that the lot fell on the king's daughter, and so the princess was tied out at the lakeshore to await the venomous dragon. Just then, the knight St. George chanced to ride past that lake. The princess, trembling, tried to warn George to leave, but he vowed to remain and face the hideous reptile. As the dragon appeared, George charged it on horseback and overcame it with his lance. Quite apart from such popular legends, dragons were described in reputable zoological treatises published during the Middle Ages. For example, the great Swiss naturalist and medical doctor Conrad Gessner published a four-volume encyclopedia from 1516 to 1565 entitled Historiae Animalium. He mentioned dragons as very rare but still living creatures. Ulysses Aldrovandus is considered by many to be the father of modern natural history. He traveled extensively, collected thousands of animals and plants, and created the first ever natural history museum. His impressive collections are today housed in a special wing at the Bologna University, where they attest to his scholarship. This background should give credence to the following incident that Aldrovandus personally reported concerning a dragon. The dragon was first seen on May 13, 1572, hissing like a snake. He had been hiding on the small estate of Master Petronius near Docius in a place called Malinolta. At 5 p.m. he was caught on a public highway by a herdsman named Baptista of Camaldulus near the hedge of a private farm, a mile from the remote city outskirts of Bologna. Baptista was following his ox cart home when he noticed the oxen suddenly come to a stop. He kicked them and shouted at them, but they refused to move and went down on their knees rather than move forward. At this point, the herdsman noticed a hissing sound and was startled to see this strange little dragon ahead of him. Trembling, he struck it on the head with his rod and killed it. Aldrovandus identified it as a reptile, the first of this type that he had seen. The strange creature seemed to be completely harmless. Aldrovandus surmised that the dragon was a juvenile, judging by the incompletely developed claws and teeth. Aldrovandus mounted the specimen and displayed it for some time. It is regrettable that, while many of his museum mounts nicely survived, the dragon mount has disappeared. An old Assiniboine Indian story tells of a war party that traveled a long distance to unfamiliar lands and saw some large lizards. The warriors held a council and discussed what they knew about those strange creatures. They decided that those big lizards were bad medicine and should be left alone. However, one warrior who wanted more war honors said that he was not afraid of those animals and would kill one. He took his lance and charged one of the large lizard-type animals and tried to kill it. But he had trouble sticking his lance in the creature's hide, and during the battle, he himself was killed and eaten. The 
the credible Jewish historian Josephus told of small flying reptiles that lived in ancient Egypt and Arabia and described how the predatory ibis bird halted their invasion into Egypt, for which service the Egyptians revered the ibis. The well-respected Greek researcher Herodotus wrote, there is a place in Arabia situated very near the city of Buto to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and is like as possible to the wings of a bat. In his third volume, Herodotus goes on to tell how these animals could sometimes be found in the Arabian spice groves. He describes their size, coloration, and reproduction. It seems flying serpents were infamous for hanging in frankincense trees. When workers wanted to gather the tree's incense, they would employ putrid smoke to drive the flying reptiles away. Aristotle and several other ancient authors also referenced these flying serpents. Reliable witness reports of flying dragons in Europe were written in the 1600s. Marie Trevelyan records, the woods around Penland Castle, Glamorgan, had the reputation of being frequented by winged serpents, and these were the terror of old and young alike. An aged inhabitant of Penlin, who died a few years ago, said that in his boyhood, the winged serpents were described as very beautiful. They were coiled when in repose, and looked as if they were covered with jewels of all sorts. Some of them had crests sparkling with all the colors of the rainbow. When disturbed, they glided swiftly, sparkling all over, to their hiding places. The popular 17th century writer Athanasius Kircher wrote how the nobleman Christopher Shoririm, prefect of the entire territory, witnessed a phenomenon written in his own words. On a warm night in 1619, while contemplating the serenity of the heavens, I saw a shining dragon of great size in front of Mount Pilatus, coming from the opposite side of the lake, moving rapidly in an agitated way seen flying across. It was of a large size, with a long tail, a long neck, a reptile's head, and ferocious gaping jaws. As it flew, it was like iron struck in a forge when pressed together that scatters sparks. At first I thought it was a meteor from what I saw, but after I diligently observed it alone, I understood it was indeed a dragon from the motion of the limbs of the entire body. The 16th century Italian explorer Pigafetta, in a report of the Kingdom of Congo, described iridescent flying dragons from the province of Bemba. There are also certain other creatures which, being as big as rams, have wings like dragons, with long tails and long chaps and diverse rows of teeth, and feed upon raw flesh. Their color is blue and green, their skin painted like scales, and they have two feet, but no more. The pagan Negroes used to worship them as gods, and to this day you may see diverse of them that are kept for a marble. And because they are very rare, the chief lords there curiously preserve them and suffer the people to worship them which tendeth greatly to their profits by reason of the gifts and oblations which the people offer unto them. In medieval times, the Scandinavians described swimming dragons, and the Vikings placed carved dragons on the front of their ships to scare off the sea monsters. Hans Egede, missionary to Greenland, was known to keep a meticulous recording of natural observations. He documented a sea monster which he saw off the coast in 1734. 
A well-publicized serpent-like sea monster sighting was made by the crew and officers of HMS Daedalus in August of 1848. The creature they saw measured approximately 60 feet long and sported a mane on its head. Numerous other such stories have been recorded from the great age of sailing ships from 1500 to 1900 AD when men traversed the ocean without the noise of modern powered vessels. Two swimming dragons are mentioned by name in scripture. First, there is the sea monster called Rahab. Then there is the ferocious Leviathan. Psalm 104, 25 to 26 says, So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. Psalm 148, 7 instructs, Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. These awe-inspiring reptiles should cause us to contemplate the power of our great Creator and give Him glory. The evidence is compelling that some of the great reptiles survived near inhabited areas and were known as dragons. Evolutionary zoologist Desmond Morris conceded, In the world of fantastic animals, the dragon is unique. It is as though there was once a whole family of different dragon species that really existed before they mysteriously became extinct. Indeed, as recently as the 17th century, scholars wrote of dragons as though they were scientific fact, their anatomy and natural history being recorded in painstaking detail. By the 19th century, dragons had largely been wiped out by expanding civilizations. Men viewed them as a threat and hunted them down, both to safeguard new lands for settlement and to prove their dominance. The changing ecosystems and rise of colonial empires drove many species, including most of the great reptiles, into extinction. And so ended the historical age of dragons and men. <laughs>